have you had a good day? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Are you still awake? Are you feeling a bit weary? Ready for... Oh, there's a quiz before we get to go to bed, right? So, there's more to come yet, people. Um, I have a word to share, and then I want us to go into maybe a bit of extended ministry time this evening. And um, I feel like there's some stuff that the Lord wants to do, so that's fun. It's always good when he's on the move, right? Um, But this afternoon, as Lou and I were just talking and praying... I I felt like I just wanted to share this story with you, and I did actually refer to it this morning, and I'll get to that in a second. But before I do, I want to just say that the stories that I'm going to tell you tonight and the scriptures that we're going to look at, I do recognize that in, in those stories and in this story in the book of John, everything goes the way that we want it to, right? But that's not always the way is it many times we pray for healing or we pray for a breakthrough or we pray I mean it seems like nothing shifts and so I just want to say I I recognize that that's a very real tension we live between the now and the not yet as John Wimber so brilliantly said and um, this is true in my own life and my husband my beautiful husband of 28 years became very seriously unwell at right at the beginning of COVID And he's been critically ill on and off over the last two years. It is a miracle that he's here right now, but we don't know how long we have him for. And so, you know, we see miracles. We do see miracles out in our mission every day of the week. And we see the sick made well. And we see the dead come back to life. And I'm going to tell you that story in a minute. We've seen it three times, but I'm going to tell you one. But we also don't. And that's just, that's the reality of the now and the not yet of the kingdom. And so I just wanted to say to you that I'm not standing here in front of you suggesting that everything that you pray for will always come to pass and every way that you want God to move, he will always do it. It doesn't always look like that. I'm praying and believing for healing for my husband. But right now, I'm not seeing the miracle that I'm asking for. But as my husband says to me every morning, baby, our circumstance doesn't define who he is. He is still good. And that's the truth, right? That's the truth. He's always good. He's always faithful. And he's always trustworthy, regardless. But he's also power. And he's also resurrection. And he's also the life. And this is what I've come to discover. This is how the Lord and I are journeying my own processing of my husband's sickness. Is At the end of the day, in Jesus, all is life. All is life. If the Lord heals my husband now and I get to keep him for the next 30 years, it's life. If he goes to be with the Lord in Jesus, death is just a gateway to even greater life. Is it the life that I want for my husband? (laughs) No. Well, yes, but no, because I love him and I want him here with me, but that might not be what happens. That's for the Lord to decide. But all is life, and the Lord is always good. I have this little phrase, I just mentioned it, that I I say it every day, and I say it to my children, and Son and I say it to each other, he's good and he's faithful and he's trustworthy, he's good and he's faithful and he's trustworthy, he's good and he's faithful and he's trustworthy. Our circumstance does not define who he is, who he is defines our circumstance. It's very different, it's very different. He's good, he's faithful, he's trustworthy. I just want you to know that I, I, I understand what it is to be in the battle, right? And um, I understand what it is to stand between the now and the not yet. And let me tell you this story because it's nothing to do with my talk in the sense tonight, but I felt the Lord lay it on my heart to share with you. And um, he is good and he's faithful and he's trustworthy. It's who he is, doesn't change. Anyway... So, 
A few years ago, we were celebrating our 10-year anniversary of Every Life beginning, and we were really excited about it, and we wanted to hold some kind of celebration and worship and thanksgiving, right? Because we've seen the Lord do so many things, mostly despite of us, not because of us, and we're just so grateful for everything we've seen him do. And Lou was around, and she helped us sort it all out, and we had a, we had a good evening, didn't we? We gathered everyone who'd been part of our story and just celebrated all that Jesus Jesus had done and someone came and had made a film for us about a you know, filmmaker had heard me speak somewhere and said I want to make a film for you and he'd flown out to Uganda and he'd filmed one of our miracle stories and documented it all and we had that on the screen and you know it was just like it was just epic it was just such a good night and in my preparation for that evening I spent some time um just reflecting back on the last 10 years of what it is that we have seen God do. And as I said, we've seen, we've seen the blind see, we've seen the deaf hear, we've seen the dead come back to life, we've seen whole villages come to faith in a day, we've seen multiplication of food, we've seen, we've seen miracle upon miracle upon miracle. We've also prayed many times and had to dig many graves. We talked about that this morning. But we were so grateful to the Lord, and, and so we gathered, and, and as I was reflecting back, I was just overwhelmed, you know, again, really, as I am on a semi-regular basis, of how so consistently through it all, through every season, and I think it would be fair to say of our ministry, we've been through every season. We've been through the great highs and the mountaintops and the victory moments, and we've walked through the valley and through pain and confusion and loss. We've walked all seasons, but as I look back on all of it, what overwhelmed me again and again was just how faithful and present God had been with us in all of it, regardless of whether we could see it or not. Regardless. He, he is good, and he's faithful, and he's trustworthy, and then on the back of like looking at the last 10 years, because as I told you earlier, I'm a visionary and I'm a strategist, I'm like then going, so what's the next 10? You know, what we, what's God got for the next 10? And how do we set ourselves up ready for that, right? What do we need to do to get ready for the next 10 years? And as I said to you earlier, I'm, I am a visionary at heart. I'm a strategist and, and I don't have any problem in dreaming big. And every January when my team is setting their goals or my different teams are setting their goals for the year, I'm like, I don't want any goals that are possible. I only want goals submitted on paper that are impossible. Because, you know, we serve a God of the impossible. Unless we need a miracle, we're not going to actually see one right? So we have impossible dream setting. And so really, I don't find it difficult to dream big. But I think even for people like me, who are just that way inclined, there are moments when the dream that God begins to put on your heart or the vision that he begins to birth on the inside of you just seems that little bit too big. You know, you, you look at the vision, the dream, and then you look at what it is that you have in your hands, and it's, you just it's just not enough. It's just not enough. It's so easy to feel like that. And again, as I was saying to you earlier, the first day we ever walked into a slum, and it was the first time, as you know, my husband and I had ever seen that kind of poverty sort of face to face. It was like suddenly the child behind the Oxfam advert became a living, breathing, tangible person. And poverty was no longer an ethereal concept. It was a stark reality. It wasn't anymore a statistic that I'd heard about or read about on the BBC News about some far-flung distance place, but it's this living, breathing, tangible person, and they're standing right in front of me, and they're looking me straight in the eye. And it demanded a response. It demanded a response. I can remember it as clear as anything, standing there, my first ever experience of being in a place like this, and there's just chaos erupting all around me. You know, slums are messy, dangerous, chaotic places, and there's sewage running underneath my feet, and there's children everywhere, and death and disease, and prostitution, and addiction, and crimes, and and noise. It's so noisy. And I'm standing there in the middle of it all, kind of like, oh. And then I hear the Lord speak. And he said to me, this, this place here, this is where I've called you to love and serve. 
And I, I would love to be able to stand here and I had some really amazingly godly response like, let it be to me according to your word. You know, something like that. But it wasn't. I just went, like, what? I'm like, are you crazy, Jesus? How am I able to make any kind of difference in a place like this? See, this is what you have to understand about me and my husband. When we moved to live in Africa, our story is not normal. We're like 101 how not to do mission. Don't follow in our example. If you want to read about it, it's in Journey into Love. But when we, when we moved to Africa, we had, had zero training in how to work overseas. We had no education in international development. We don't have a theology degree between the two of us. We've never been to ministry school. We've not even done a YWAM DTS. Do you know what I mean? It's like, we've done nothing. We have nothing to recommend us. And we made the decision to move and then move within eight weeks. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy. My husband has a degree in physics, for goodness sakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, who was that? <laughs> you want to keep that quiet, friend. And it turned out that the, the theory of thermodynamics, thermodynamics, is that right? Yeah. Is really unhelpful when it comes to issues of malnutrition and gang violence. <laughs> it just doesn't help. I don't understand it anyway, so that's good news. But to say that we were unqualified for the task that the Lord had just given us would be a massive understatement. And we felt so overwhelmed. And I understand, Simon, we are so outside of our depth. <laughs> This is ridiculous. What is the Lord even thinking? This is what I think. As believers, which we all are, I think that we are very good at being our own worst critics. We put ourselves down constantly. We play the game of comparison all the time. And we actually play it really, really well. Comparison with our bodies, with our marriages, or our work life, or our sex life, or our I know, social life, or whatever it is. And we compare ourselves all the time to each other, in and out of the church, and so easily decide that, well, as for me, I fail on so many levels. You know, I don't just quite make the grade. I'm not as holy as, as this person, or as intelligent as this person, or as educated as this person, or as anointed as this person. I, I'm not as gifted as that person. I'm not introvert enough. I'm not extrovert enough. I'm not enough. Anybody relate? (laughs) I feel like this on a regular basis. And we so quickly can write ourselves off. We can actually write ourselves off from his love, being worthy of his love as well as worthy of his service. Right? But this is the thing. So often, what we say what we believe and what we see when we look at ourselves or what the world says, what the world believes or what the world sees is actually very contrary to what Jesus says, what Jesus believes and what he sees. And this is the thing that we have to understand. We need to, we need to work out whose opinion we're going to live our lives out in agreement with. Our own the world's, or his. We have to make that decision. We have to understand. Let's turn in our Bibles to John 6. Are you all okay and are you all with me? Yeah? Yeah? All right. Let's go to John 6. I don't mind questions, by the way. You know, or heckles. I quite like it. I'm I'm preaching Africa. I'm used to it. So John 6, verse 1. This is probably my most favorite story in the whole of the Gospel of John. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated 
as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. Now, this was a really impossible situation that Jesus and the disciples found themselves in that day. Agreed? Really impossible. There were no supermarkets nearby, no cool artisan bakeries on the hillside, no coffee shops where they could nip off and get some refreshments for everyone. They're in the middle of nowhere. They've got nothing available to them. And Jesus, in the middle of this moment, he turns to his friend Philip and is like, hey, Philip, what are we going to do? Where are we going to get the bread to feed the people? How are we going to deal with this situation, Philip? Now, Philip... He was an amazing disciple. He was known as the evangelist. And by this point in time, he's been hanging out with Jesus for quite a while. So he's already seen Jesus perform many healing signs and wonders. He's seen miracles. He's seen it all going on firsthand. So his response to Jesus, it it totally fascinates me. And also kind of surprises me because his answer is this, six months wages won't buy enough bread for everyone to eat and have a bite. And let's be honest, his answer is factually correct. He's right. He's right. He's not wrong. His answer is factually correct. But then another answer comes along. And here comes this boy holding in his hands some bread and some fish. And what happens next is utterly fascinating to me. Because Jesus and the disciples, they both see exactly the same thing, right? They both see a little boy coming towards them with his little packed lunch. But how they respond to it totally different. So the disciples see it and they say, how far will this go among so many? It's not enough. It's not enough. But Jesus, oh, I love this story so much. Jesus, Jesus sees the little boy and he's like, this is perfect. This is exactly what we need. Tell everybody to sit down, it's time to eat. And Jesus, he just rejects natural wisdom and the factual truth of what that little insignificant packed lunch could accomplish and instead he chooses to go to the boy he chooses to go to the not enough and then he begins to fill it with himself and then something miraculous begins to take place and everybody eats food it's it's so it's so amazing He's like, this is perfect. Let me take that tiny little offering, that, this little handful of things that you have to give me. Let me take hold of that. And let me fill it with me. And let's see what will happen. Let's see what I can do. He's the God of miracles. I remember the very first time we ever saw the multiplication of food and it was Christmas and we hadn't been living in Uganda for very long and one of my Ugandan staff members came and said oh um, I've got this great idea I think we should throw a banquet feast for everyone who lived in this particular slum community we'll have to ticket it but we'll get everyone invited and then we'll like we'll get a hall it was it wasn't a hall it was just wood and top all in but it was a shade we'll get this space and then we'll cook a huge feast and it's going to be free and everyone can come and we'll have a great big christmas party and i'm like oh it's a great idea like let's do it i'm up, I'm up for that so they start organizing it and then she comes again and she's like but i've got another idea wouldn't it be really really nice if at christmas when we get to sit down and eat our chicken every one of our sp- um, slum families gets to eat a chicken as well I'm like, that would be nice, but chicken is a rare luxury. Meat is luxury. Food is a luxury. Chicken is like the meat to end all meats. And so she's like, wouldn't that be nice? I'm like, that's a great idea. Go and order all the chickens that you think we need and let's do that. That'll be really, that'll be really fun. Now, I do not know what happened in my brain that day, but this is how I saw this playing out. Okay. Here's the top haul any place with all the food and 
Here is the, here's the grass, and here comes the nice Tesco van, refrigerated and full of killed and plucked chickens in bubble wrap. You know what I mean? Like, boop, 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 boop. And we fling open the doors and we hand them all a nice prepared chicken. And I don't know why I thought that was going to be reality. These people live in mud houses. They don't have electricity. They certainly don't have a fridge. So imagine my surprise when a flatbed truck arrives with this massive cage full of hundreds of live chickens that are squawking and flapping and then the community thought it would be really quite fun for me and my husband to hand them out one at a time so I've got film and video of me running around trying to catch these blimmin' chickens and handing them over as they're biting my hand it was horrible, it was traumatic and I said we're never doing that again but the community loved it and we, we gave everyone a chicken anyway back to the food we didn't have very much money and um, for the food and so all of my staff, they're all Ugandan, they're all emptying their pockets. You know, well, I've got this much cash, I've got this much cash. And we got what we had together and we went to some women in our village and we just said to them, is this enough money to cook food for this many people? And they were like, well, not really, but we can try and make it work. If we just keep the portions not too big, I'm like, okay, let's do it. Let's just do it. So we do it. We rock up, we've got these massive saucepans full of beans and chicken and rice and matoki and other things. And people start to come. It's really exciting. You know, everyone starts to queue up and come, and they're coming through, and the staff team are serving. If you've ever been to Africa, you never get a small portion of food. It's always like a mini mountain. They're serving these mini mountains of food, and people are coming through. And it's all going well until I began to realize that word was spreading around the village. Yeah, that free food was being handed out in this particular place. And people started to come from everywhere, you know, other slum communities who weren't actually invited to this particular party. And I could see them, because I know who they are, I could see them joining the queue at the back. And I'm getting nervous. See, slum culture is very volatile. And things can change in a moment. And if you promise something that you don't deliver, they might kill you. I mean, you don't mess around. This, isn't, this is real. So I'm there, and I'm like, mm, okay, we're, we're going to be in some trouble. <laughs> so I thought, I've got to take it on the chin. I've got to take one for the team. So I'm going to walk up, and I'm going to form a human barrier. That was my plan. So I, walked, I was walking towards the back of the queue to stand in between the people who are invited and the uninvited guests to film a human barrier to say, I'm so sorry, <laughs> but you're actually not invited. We'll, we'll do something another day. As I'm walking towards the queue, I heard the Lord just spoke. Vroom. Feed everyone, refuse no one. So I said, Jesus, you don't understand. We don't have enough food. <laughs> I don't have enough food to do that. He said it again, feed everyone, refuse no one. I'm like, Lord, I, I, I've done the numbers. I, I don't have enough food. Feed Everyone, refuse no one. I don't know about you, but my experience tells me that when the Lord says something three times, you better pay attention. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So this is what I did. I went to the servery. I'm like, okay, everyone, listen. We've got way more people and not enough food. So I want you to halve your portion sizes. Like, we're going small now. Like, just stretch it out, make it work, you know. And they're like, oh, yeah, absolutely, Nicola. Boom, you know, and they just kept on going. Like, oh. Anyway, we got through and, and we fed everyone that turned up, and, and I was so stunned. So I went to where they were serving, and I was like, ready to kind of like high five, you know, like, woohoo, well done, team, you stretched the food. And they were like, no, you don't understand, look inside the saucepan. So I looked, I mean, they're massive. I looked inside, and there was almost as much food as when we began. And I was just confused. I was like, that's really weird. Like, I'm pretty good with figures. Like, that doesn't make any, that doesn't make any sense. So I'm like, oh, well, OK. Well, looks like we can do seconds. So we invited anyone wants some seconds. Everybody comes because they love it. They came. Everyone got a second mountain. And they sat down. And I went back really like, woo. Oh, look in the saucepan. Still almost as much food as when we began. At that point in time, I'm like, I just I don't get it. I'm just generally confused. I don't, Understand. So then we asked people up for thirds. Nobody wanted any. So I'm like, well, this is this is good food. 
So I've got pictures of me and my husband like carrying these massive saucepans. I'm like, pick up the food and let's travel. So we walked with our team and we walked all the way around all the surrounding areas and we were just yelling out, anybody want some free food? And people started to come. It was one of the most humbling experiences of my life because people who had buckets or jerry cans came and we would pour the food in. And people who didn't own one, they would come with a carrier bag and we would pour the food into the carrier bag and they would tie it up and run home and then come back with another one. We moved all the way around the surrounding area till we got to the very last house and then instantly the food ran out. And that's when I got it. I was like, oh, we've just seen a miracle. We've seen a miracle today. And I think it would be fair to say that that story in some ways really is the testimony of the last 13 years of seeing Jesus come and take our not enough and fill it with himself and begin to do something miraculous through it. We've just seen him come and do that time and time again to come and take the little, small and insignificant offerings of our lives with all the things that don't qualify us to do anything. But as we lay them down before him, Here we are, Jesus. Take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee. He comes and he takes them and he begins to fill us with himself and the hungry get fed. That's what he does. It's who he is. The bottom line It's not about you or me at the end of the day. It's about him through you and me. But I would say this to you. Do not disregard the significance of your life. Do not disregard the significance of his life through your life. You were born to help change the world. Catherine Booth, another hero in the faith of mine. Her and her husband, William, as you know, founded the Salvation Army. I heard once that every night when her children went to bed, she would tuck them in and she would say, so you were born to help change the world. I liked it. I'm like, I'm going to do that with my kids. (laughs) So I did for about three weeks. I'm like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, we were born to help change the world. But it's like true, you know. I still say it to my son sometimes. He works in Parliament. I'm like, son, come on. Head up, eyes on Jesus, born to help change the world. Chantel, come on, head up, born to help change the world. It's in those moments I've found, really, you know those moments in life where you find yourself in a situation and you just feel really small, (laughs) and the situation feels really big and you feel really weak, and it feels really overwhelming, you know, those situations. I found that it's in those moments that he comes the most powerfully. Scripture tells us that it's in those moments that his power is actually made perfect. That's the truth. And as my beautiful husband says to me, circumstance doesn't get to define who he is. Who he is defines our circumstance. It's true. See, circumstance says 5,000 hungry people and not enough food to eat, but Jesus said something different. Circumstance says your brother is dead and he's in the morgue, but then Jesus comes and he begins to move and something begins to change and the hungry are fed and shattered lives are restored and the broken are made whole and the fractured are put back together again and communities begin to heal and suddenly what was impossible becomes very possible because of him 
in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You're born to help change the world. And I would like to take some time. I don't know how long we have, I can't see. I would like to take some time. It's okay, because it's only uh, like 1.30 in Canada right now, so <laughs> we've got hours. My watch still hasn't shifted. That's not helpful. I would like to take some time to pray tonight. And I feel like I've, I've been a bit rambly. I, I hope I've made some sense. But my, my heart this evening is to encourage you that however not enough you feel, he is your enough. All you need is Jesus. He changes everything. When he walks into a room, everything changes. <laughs> the dead come back to life. The hungry begin to be fed. That's what he does. It's who he is. He's the God of the impossible. And he really is truly everything that he says he is. I say that to my team sometimes, I'm like, hey guys, how about today, when we go out, we just decide to dare to believe that he really is everything that he says he is. Let's just see what happens. Changes, it changes how they interact with people, you know? Because they go out going, he's healer, he's saviour, he's deliverer, he's redeemer, he's restorer, he's rescuer, he is, he is, he is. And I watch them, they begin to move. Boom, 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 boom. You see, the power of God comes. And I feel like tonight, I would like to create some time for us to pray into your impossibility. I know what my impossibility is right now. I've told you what my impossibility is. I don't know what yours is, but the Lord does. And he is the God of the impossible. And I want to pray into that tonight. But first, I feel like it would be really good to take a few moments for us all together to just break agreements that we might have made with things that other people have spoken over our lives or we have spoken over ourselves that are not who God says that we are, are not our true identity. So I'm going to ask him, we're just going to do it quietly, privately, in your seat, you and the Lord. It's nobody else's business. This is between you and Jesus. But I'm going to ask you all to just take a moment and just close your eyes and just going to lead us through a little prayer because these kind of prayers changed my life. You know, I was saying to you, was it last night? Gosh, it feels longer ago than that. I had this couple who wrapped their arms around us, you know, and called out the gold and called out the rubbish, broke off the, the false identity and released a new identity, our true identity, and it changed my life. And I feel like the Lord wants to do a bit of that with us tonight. So let's just close our eyes. Holy Spirit, we love you. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love your presence. We love everything about you. We're so thankful for the gift that you are to your church. And we invite you just to come right now and minister to our hearts. And I just want you quietly just to ask the Lord to show you if there are any lies that you have believed about yourself or aligned yourself with, things that have been either spoken over you by someone else or things that you have spoken over yourself. And this is things like, I'm not enough. I'm not worthy. I'm too broken. I just, I just, I made too big a mess. No one sees me. No one wants me. How could I be used? Just ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to your heart. And you'll just, you might just hear a word, you know, in, inside of your mind. What is it? What is the false label that you've been wearing? The false identity that you've been carrying that is stopping you from stepping into your full identity as a, as a child of God? Let's just take a moment and ask the Lord. Holy Spirit, would you help us? We don't want to live in the lie, we want to live in the truth. We 
For some of you, it's more than one thing. For some of you, it's like a, it's a person of authority who's just said over you over and over, you're not good enough, you'll never be anything. No one ever wants to hear what you've got to say. Who do you think you are? Let's take a moment and recognize it. Quietly in your heart, name it. As the Lord wants to set us free tonight. And I'm just going to pray a prayer and you quietly again, this is nobody else's business, just in the quietness of your own heart, I want you to pray after me. Say, Lord, I repent for believing the lie that I am. And then just name it. Lord, I repent for believing the lie that I am not good enough, that I am not lovable, that I am too broken, that I'm too old. I'm too young. I repent for believing the lie. List them out. And I break agreement with those lies right now in the name of Jesus. And I put the cross between me and the lies. And in their place, I receive the truth that, now wait, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. What's the truth? You're loved. You are accepted. You're chosen. You're worthy. You're seen. You're valued. Lord, I receive the truth that, and in your heart, speak it out. Lord, I thank you for the truth of who you say that we are. And Lord, I pray that over these days and weeks that you would continue to reveal to each one of us, count me in, Lord, me too, that you would continue to reveal to each one of us where we've aligned ourselves with things that are not true, words that are not from you. And I bless every person in this room to walk in their true identity as a son, as a daughter, anointed, chosen, appointed, loved, accepted, protected, cared for. I bless them to walk in freedom that comes from you, Jesus, because who the Son sets free, they shall be free indeed. And I bless them to walk in your freedom. Would you come and seal what you're doing in our hearts, Holy Spirit? <clears throat> 